Section 1.3 is about how to collect sample data, and this section is pretty heavy on terminology, but it's not terribly long, so hopefully it's just not this huge barrage of terms, but unfortunately there is a, just a lot of terminology here, um, kind of all concentrated into one spot. The first distinction between an observational study and an experiment, this up here is actually a pretty big deal. So being able to tell these two things apart, that's going to come up repeatedly later. Um, these are the two big types of studies. So if you think of it as like a tree that kind of builds outward, so you'd have all types of studies and then observational studies and experiments, and then those both break down further from there. So how do you tell an observational study and an experiment apart, right? That would be the important thing. And really what it comes down to is, are the individuals being studied just free to do whatever they want? Or is there something somewhere that they're kind of forced or imposed to do? Um, that's really what you end up looking for. Because with an observational study, like it says there in the definition, um, basically it's just observe and record. And that's it. So the key phrase, as far as telling them apart, I think would be this. So does not interfere. And in an experiment, I suppose then it would be does interfere, which would be this thing right here where it says the researcher applies or imposes some treatment. That would be the interference part. So either it's you leave the individuals alone, you let them do whatever they want to do, and you record what goes on. That's the observational study. Or with the experiment, it's rather than leaving them entirely alone, there's at least one thing where it becomes, okay, this group, you're doing this thing, and then this group, you're doing this other thing, and then we're going to record what happens. And the experiment does give you more powerful, stronger results but there are going to be situations where you can't do them. Either they're logistically impossible or they cause major ethical issues, things like that. And all of that will come out a little bit later. But um, that would also be, be true um, as far as like um, what gives you the better results and, and that sort of thing. So the next couple of things on here, these, these three examples, um, they're just about telling observational studies and experiments apart. So this first example has one of each and we just have to figure out which is which. So it says both studies are designed to examine the effect of fertilizer on the yield of an apple orchard. And we've got one of each. We've got to figure out which one's the experiment, which one's the observational study. So the first one, it says researchers find several different apple orchards record the amount of fertilizer used and the yield. Second one, the difference is right here, the assign different amounts of fertilizer to each orchard. So if you're looking at these two and you know one of them's an observational study and the other one's an experiment, basically what you're looking for is you're looking for which one has something that's imposed upon the individuals, which I suppose here, it looks like the individuals in the study are apple orchards. Like rather than individual apples, it looks like the individuals are the different orchards, which is fine, but it does look like that's what they are. So the key word here, the one that jumps out to me, it's in the second bullet point. It's right here. Assign. So assign different amounts of fertilizer. To me, that says, okay, that's the one where it's not that whoever runs the orchard is gonna do whatever they're gonna do, right? That's the one where it's you. You're going to put this fertilizer in your orchard and you, you're gonna put this other fertilizer in your orchard, right? That's the one where there's the treatment being imposed. So a sign is the key word there. So I would think this one right here, that's gonna be the experiment which would then force this first one up here, if I have enough room to write this in, I think I do, that this is gonna be the observational study. And I suppose I can always cheat and write off the page. It's not like it won't work out there, but it looks weird, so I'm trying to avoid it. Um, but yeah, that's basically the difference. And if, if you look at this first one, and if you just um, kind of ignore the second bullet point for a second, I guess pretend that you've never seen it before, 
And if you look at that first one, you go, okay, there are a bunch of apple orchards and they just record the amount of fertilizer and then the yield. So that one is just observe and record, right? So you could also look at it directly and go, okay, that fits the definition of an observational study. And then this one, different amounts, right? That's, that are being assigned, right? So right there, uh -huh, impose treatment, that one's gotta be the experiment. And that is the way that it works out. Okay, the next couple are just, is it this or is it this, um, right? Is it an observational study, is it an experiment? So this first one with the trees and the pollution, it says that we find a sample of city blocks, I suppose we being the experimenters here, with similar levels of air pollution, and we're gonna plant trees in half the blocks in the sample. Then after waiting an appropriate amount of time, we're going to measure the air pollution levels. Okay. Well, as far as is there a treatment being imposed, which I think is the thing that you want to look for here, then you say, well, how do the trees get there? Right, the, the blocks that have the trees. The trees don't just naturally show up in this situation, right? It says we're planting them. So here, we, or the experimenters, whatever we represents, um, we are imposing that treatment because right, we think that the trees are going to reduce air pollution. So we're saying, all right, we're going to put trees on these blocks. We're not going to put trees on these other blocks. So whether the trees are there or not, that's an imposed treatment here, which would mean that this first study is going to be an experiment. Right. If there is an imposed treatment somehow, you've got an experiment. So here it's the trees. And I picked this one because it's a little tougher to see. You don't normally think of planting trees or not planting trees as being an imposed treatment. Right. Usually most people think of something medical, like either you're getting like the active new drug or you're getting a placebo, right? Like something like that. And I think that's more natural. Um, but here, even though this is a little bit different, it's still that concept. It's still what goes on in that block, right? We're making that call on are there going to be trees there or not for every individual block. Then the other example, I suppose if there are two of them and one of them is an experiment, maybe you'd be anticipating that this would be an observational study, but we should check and make sure. So to determine whether farm-grown salmon contain more omega-3 oils if water is more acidic, look at what we do. We collect samples of salmon and water from multiple fish farms to see if the two variables are related. So basically what we're doing is we're just collecting samples and we're checking them out, right? We're just um, doing some measurements, um, right? To, I guess, checking the pH, that kind of thing. Um, but there's nothing being imposed here on the fish farms, right? It's not um, anything like, okay, this fish farm, uh, we're going to have, you know, a pH that's lower than at this other fish farm, right? And we're going to make sure that this happens with the, with the water pH, right? No, nothing like that's going on. It's just we're going to take samples, we're going to record what's going on. So that's just a straight up observe and record observational study. So that's what I'm going to put in here. So observational study. Okay. So that's a big distinction if you're given a study to be able to figure out is this an observational study or is this an experiment and then it does break down further from there and that's actually what the rest of this section kind of touches on and that starts right away because the next thing is different types of observational studies that you can have there isn't really a lot that i can add in to like make this a whole lot more interactive with writing and stuff um so a cross-sectional study, um, that's going to be actually one that's really common because that's when data are collected at a specific point in time. And that's like an opinion poll. That's a cross-sectional study because if you ever look at where they have the methodology section at the very end of an opinion poll, like very, very end, like after what looks like the last paragraph of writing is usually where it is. But it'll give like a date range that'll be really short. You know, it'll be like, you know, this data was collected on August 8th and 9th, 
or something like that. So, right, there's your specific point in time. Um, and so that's going to be a cross-sectional study. Um, another big one, which I've got in here, is estimating the current unemployment rate. Right. If it's the current unemployment rate, right, that's a I guess those um, the measurements, right, the data would have to be collected at a pretty recent point in time. Right. Unemployment data that's five years old doesn't really matter for the current unemployment rate. So um, that's another one that's a cross sectional study. So these are really, really common, actually. And most of the things that you would point to and go, that's an observational study. They tend to be those. Um, but you can also have prospective and retrospective studies, which just from the terms, you can probably figure out what they are, right? If you say prospective, it sounds like that's you know, projecting into the future, and retrospective sounds like it would have something to do with the past. And that's correct. Both of those things are correct. So like it says there, a prospective study designed to collect data in the future um, from groups that share common factors. Um, so like birth cohort studies, um, where you chart the lives of individuals born like in a, in a certain year, in a certain month, um, or you know, even like a certain year, month, and a certain city, right? And, and then you chart throughout their lives. Um, that's a prospective study. Um, or another one following a group of smokers and a group of non-smokers over time. Um, to see which ones develop lymphoma, or I guess to see the rates of lymphoma in the two groups. I guess that's really how you'd get the comparison there. Um, and this also kind of folds into a thing called longitudinal analysis that would factor into this too, where then um, you look at those individuals at like after every, like you take some interval of time and you look at them um, after every interval, like every year, every five years or something. Um, but we'll just stick to prospective studies are where they're set up to collect data in the future, right? You set everything up at the beginning, and then as the future plays out, you collect the data. Retrospective, that's where all of the data exists already. So it's stuff that's already happened. And then um, you piece your observational study together based on that data that's already been collected, right? Um, because all of the stuff has happened, so therefore the data has been collected. So you would just have to go get it, more or less. Um, and then I tried to make it to where the two examples kind of were the same subject matter, um, just to, to maybe highlight what the difference would be a little bit easier. So that second example, the retrospective study one, if we're going to locate a group of subjects with lymphoma, and then to kind of work backward and see, well, was there a point in their lives when they were regular smokers? Um, and then for comparison, um, you would want a group of subjects who never developed lymphoma. And then you want to see, well, was there ever a point in their lives where they were regular smokers? Um, right. So here it's like you start off with the result, the lymphoma or not lymphoma, and then you work backwards. Um, and then here it's like you're starting off with the cause, right? Or the thing that would be the hypothesized cause where it's, are they smokers, are they not smokers? You make those two groups and then you see how things play out, um, right? So this one's set up to um, collect data from the future. And this one, essentially it's all already happened, right? So you're collecting data for things that happened in the past, right? But that's what those words mean, right? Perspective and retrospective. So at least everything's nice and consistent here. Next thing. Um, sampling methods, and by sampling methods, I mean good sampling methods, not poor sampling methods. Because just like we had in the last section, you can have poor sampling methods. But the big one for a good sampling method is something called a simple random sample. And the thing that I have phrased there, um, that's the correct, I guess, more thorough definition that you select a sample of n subjects, where n is your sample size, right? If you want a sample size of 100, n is 100. If you want a sample size of 5,000, n is 5,000. So I just had to generalize that as far as I could. But a sample of n subjects is selected in a way that every sample of size n has the same chance of being selected. Most people think of it this way in this thing that I have written up here in blue, um, that all individuals have the same chance of being chosen. That is true. All individuals do have the same chance of being chosen. But the thing that's here 
printed instead of handwritten is actually a slightly stronger statement and implies the one that I wrote in blue. So that's why I've got it written out that way, even though the way that most people think about it is more like the way that's in blue. And that's not wrong, it's just that there is a way to say it that's a little bit stronger. And with the homework, I think that's probably what you'd want to look for, the one that's a little bit stronger. Um, and then another way to think of it, just to get a mental image, it's like the idea of picking names out of a hat, just a little more formal and rigorous. Um, but for an example, suppose a company with 10,000 employees wants to estimate the average number of overtime hours their employees worked in a year, and maybe they don't have an easy way to recall all that data, because 10,000 people is kind of a lot. So how could they obtain a simple random sample of 300 employees to then get an estimate based off of that sample? Okay, well, this is a lot easier if you can do it with numerical labels, because this is basically how most software is set up to do it. Even something like if you were gonna use Excel, it's much easier to um, attach a numerical label to each individual and then sort by, you know, like, like randomize those labels and then, you know, the first 300 that come up, you say, okay, the employees that go along with those numbers, that's what you'd want. And that's basically what, what this is, just more general than just what you would do in a spreadsheet. But you would want labels. So if you have 10,000 employees, you want one label for each employee, right? That seems pretty logical. So you'd label them one through 10,000. Then you'd use some kind of random number, number generator. So you could use Excels or you could use randomizer.org, which is strictly a random number generator. Um, something like that too. You could, any random number generator you want, but you would use one to obtain a random sample of 300 labels, right? Because what you're gonna get in your sample is a bunch of numbers. So you're gonna get, oh, 7,218 and 2,406 and whatever, right? You get all these numbers. And then the way you get your sample is you go, okay, well, in our original list, which employee corresponded to label 2,406? That person is now in our sample. And you would do that with every label that you'd have. So employees that correspond to those labels are gonna make up the sample like it says right here. And that process manually would be really tedious, but with a computer, it's really, it's really fast. So, um, so yeah, like if, if you think about that, like if you're gonna do the whole thing by hand, then you think this feels like it would take a while. And that's true, but if you use a computer, it doesn't take very long. Other options or other possibilities, um, a systematic sample, um, sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so like it says there, it works if the population are arranged in some natural sequence. Um, if not, then it doesn't really work so well. But um, what you'd want is just you have some starting point and then every kth subject where whatever k is, it just depends on how big you want your sample to be. If you're gonna go every 10th person, or I guess every 10th individual, um, every 50th individual, every 25th individual, whatever you're gonna do. So like um, it says here, and usually this is one where um, people aren't the individuals. Um, if it's something like testing products to see like the rate of how often they're defective, that's actually where this is good, right? Because then you have like this uniform procedure of how they're being made, you know, whether it's headphones here or computer chips or whatever, right? You would think whatever process assembles these things, it ought to be identical every single time. So this is one where, yeah, you could do it this way systematically where you just check every 20th or whatever and that seems like it would actually work pretty well. So like it says here, suppose headphones are being manufactured in a factory and every 20th pair is gonna be checked for defects. So if the first pair is selected randomly out of the first 20 and let's say it's the 12th one, then from 12, you just keep adding 20. So then if the 12th one is selected, then you'd also select the 32nd, right? Because that's 12 plus 20. Add 20 to that, you're gonna select the 52nd. Add 20 to that, you're gonna select the 72nd, then 92nd, then 112th, and so forth, right? That's how a systematic sample would work. And it's good for things like that, right? Where, um, like, like in manufacturing, that's where this is actually a, a pretty common thing. Next, oh, here's a bad thing, a convenience sample. 
So a convenience sample is one that's easy to get. And that's why people do it, right? And this came up in the last section where when people collect sample data badly, like when they, you know, when they have a bad sampling method, it's because it's easy and fast. And this is easy and fast. Um, so convenient, right? That, that sounds like that's a, a thing that would simplify um, the sampling process and data collection. And that's true. But you tend to get things that are kind of distorted. Um, but let's see. Um, surveys usually end up being um, convenient samples um, since they're conducted using a single medium. Um, so like online or over the phone and so forth. Um, and a voluntary response sample, which came up before, you can think of that as being a type of convenience sample. Um, and a convenience sample isn't really ideal. Um, and yeah, it tends to be faster, but also sometimes like in a practical sense, that's about all that you can do. Like if you're like right now, we're in an election cycle. Right. And if you're trying to put out, um, you know, a new estimate um, as far as the 2020 presidential election is concerned, like you got to turn that out pretty fast. And in order to do that, you probably have to stick to a single medium just in order to collect your data fast enough. Right. So there it's not because um, the person doing the data collection is lazy or anything like that. Right. It's just, you know, that's what the circumstances kind of require. Like you've got to be able to do it fast. And usually for um, presidential polls, um, a lot of those are done over the phone, right? Where it's like, okay, we just stick to this one medium. You know, we ought to be able to get a big enough sample relatively quickly, and then we can get a new estimate. And, you know, we can keep churning these out over and over and over again um, as we get closer to the election, right? I mean, that's typically the way that that works. Um, and let's see, the, the example that's here, um, so the example is estimating the average amount of money people spent on their primary vehicle, but obtaining the sample data by talking to people in the lobby of a five-star hotel. Okay, this is one where um, I think you could argue that this would be one where the researcher is not really putting in the legwork. Um, clearly, you'd get something distorted if you were trying to relate this back to you know, all motor vehicle owners in the U.S., because not everybody can afford to stay at five-star hotels. So, right, I mean, right there, you're going to shrink um, what would be called your sampling frame, um, which is where your individuals actually come from. That's going to be like this little piece of the population, right? The wealthier piece that can afford to go to a five-star hotel. And you think, well, if somebody can afford to go to a five-star hotel, there's a good chance that they're going to have a more expensive vehicle, right? That, that would be pretty logical. Um, so then what you're going to end up with is kind of an inflated estimate um, for the average amount that people spend on their vehicle because you're going to get a lot of people in your sample that bought really expensive vehicles. So um, the point here is that with a convenience sample, you can end up with a distorted estimate. Um, Right. Just like um, if you're going to do something involving phones, if you only use landlines, you're going to end up with a distorted estimate because the part of the population um, that still has a landline or um, only has a landline, um, a lot of times that's going to skew toward families or older people living alone. Right, like those are the two groups that most commonly have a landline at this point. Um, and I guess you could argue like people who run their own businesses out of their house um, sometimes have a landline too. Um, but then there are big groups of the population, like big subgroups that wouldn't have landlines generally or um, the proportion of, um, you know, like let's say younger adults, like, like the way they usually break down the demographics, like, 18 to 34, right? You have somebody that's 18 to 34 living alone, the chance that they have a landline is actually not that high, right? So there you go, well, I think that group's gonna get underrepresented. And that's where you run into trouble. If you have one subgroup overrepresented, another one consequently underrepresented, that's when you get results that are kind of distorted. And that's what would happen here too. Um, with the five-star hotel thing, 
you'd end up with wealthier people being overrepresented in that sample and you'd get a, an average, um, like you'd get your estimate for that average that's gonna be way too high. All right, next thing, um, a stratified sample. This is like a simple random sample, but more complicated. Basically, it's made up of simple random samples. So let's say that instead of just having one estimate for the entire population, you said, you know what would be great is if instead of that, we had a way of comparing subgroups of the population. You know, however you want to do it. I guess age would be the easy one, but like maybe by age or maybe by um, geographic location or by what people do for a living, something like that. Um, so we can do that, but what you'd have to do is um, if you're going to still kind of do it using this simple random sample framework is whatever subgroups you want to compare, you got to think of that in advance and break your population up into subgroups. And then you take a simple random sample out of each one. So subgroups or strata, which is where the word stratified comes from, but strata and subgroups are the same thing. I guess stratum would be a singular subgroup. But anyway, that's what you would do. It's you break your population up into subgroups, take a simple random sample out of each one, and then you can compare subgroups, right? So you get this extra thing that you didn't have before. And this isn't always the thing that you want, but sometimes it is. And if it is, then maybe this is the kind of sample that you want. So like it says here, there's an advertising firm that wants to figure out how much to emphasize TV advertising um, in a certain county. And what they're gonna do um, they're going to conduct a sample survey to estimate the average amount of hours each week that households within that county watch television. So let's say that this county has two towns in it and a rural area. So town A is built around a factory. Most households contain factory workers with school-aged children. And then town B contains mainly retirees. And then in the rural area C, the people who live there are mostly farmers. So in a stratified sample, because these groups all look pretty different from each other, right? Um, just in terms of what they do for a living. So you think, okay, well maybe we should look at these groups separately um, and kind of compare them to see if, um, if we need to kind of adjust for different groups, like do things a little bit differently. Um, and in a stratified sample, what you would do is you'd say, okay, well, um, we're gonna break things up uh, we're going to take the population of the whole county and we're going to say, all right, town A, that's one subgroup, town B is another, and then rural area C is another. We're going to take a simple random sample out of each one. So that's what we're going to do. Because then you think, well, if, you know, if maybe the farmers, they're outside working a lot, they don't really watch TV that much, then maybe we shouldn't spend a lot of money on um, the broadcast that they're getting. Right? Like you shouldn't spend a lot of money on advertising um, for whatever they're getting out in that rural area because they're not really watching TV that much. Right? That's the kind of thing that you'd, that you'd be trying to look for with the stratified sample. These last couple you don't see nearly as much, but you do see them once in a while, so they're worth bringing up. And also they show up in the homework. I guess they're worth bringing up for that reason too. So a cluster sample. This still has the idea of like subgroups, um, except here they're called clusters. So like it says here, um, you divide the population into sections or clusters. And then what you end up doing is that then you randomly select clusters and then you collect data from every individual in the selected clusters. So like it says here, suppose that a researcher wants to estimate the average seniority of mail carriers in Tucson, and the mail carriers are divided into clusters by zip code, and several zip codes are selected. And then the seniority is then determined for all carriers in each selected zip code, right? So um, if, if we have our clusters, right, then we select several clusters, right, because each zip code is going to correspond to a cluster of mail carriers, right, the ones that work there in that zip code. And then you figure out the seniority for each carrier in each of the selected zip codes, right? So there's how it would work with clusters. By comparison, since the other one that involves subgroups is a stratified sample or a stratified random sample, how would that work? 
Well, then what you could do is you could still use the zip codes as subgroups, essentially, right? Um, so subgroups or strata, and then you would take a random sample out of each zip code. So let's say five carriers out of each zip code, because I think what you end up with generally um, is that each zip code, I think this is more of like a US number than an Arizona number, but I think roughly you get about 15 carriers per zip code. Um, so randomly select five, then we're sampling five out of those roughly 15 every time um, and setting it up like that. Um, and then the other, the last possible sampling method here that we've got, the multi-stage sample, um, that's essentially one that's more complicated. So some combination of the previous methods. Um, so in order to make election survey ones better, then um, you know maybe it isn't just a straight up simple random sample. There's more that goes into that. Um, and realistically, like if you're going to do things like control for non-response, like where you um, contact an individual and you don't get anything from them, right? Or somebody selected to be in the sample, you don't get anything from them. Um, that, like how to handle that, you end up in multi-stage territory right away, where you end up with kind of a mixture of the different methods. Um, but yeah, these essentially, if you just want to think of them as they involve some sort of combination of the other stuff that's up above, that's pretty accurate. Um, it's really general, but it's also accurate. Then the types of errors. Okay, let's see. This first one you can't really avoid. I suppose you can reduce the errors by taking a larger sample, which we're going to talk about a whole lot in the future. But a random sampling error happens when the sample has been selected randomly, but there's some sort of difference between the sample measure and the true population measure. This is almost always going to be what happens. Um, and basically the way that you can counteract that is you just say, well, if we have a big enough sample, then what, whatever measurement we get from the sample shouldn't be too far off from what's in the population. Um, because there's no way to guarantee that they're gonna match up exactly unless you take a census. Um, and this error is just due to chance and having the error exist is unavoidable, but you can reduce it. Um, like if you have a large enough sample, then the errors won't be as big, right? And they, and they won't be, be as much of a problem if they're not as big. So there is a way that you can counteract it, but you can't make it go away. Um, then non-sampling errors, um, things like um, incorrect data entry or um, if you have a questionnaire, if it's worded strangely where it pushes people toward one answer instead of another, um, people giving wrong answers on purpose, um, which tends to happen if they're kind of like sensitive questions being asked. Um, Non-response, that's the big one, right? Because like, I think it's in the first section, um, 1.1, 1 .1, if you do a telephone poll, you should expect a response rate of about 8%. So then non-response is a huge deal. Um, but generally that I think would be the biggest one here. And it's, it's the hardest one to control too. Um, but you can have those kinds of errors. And then a non-random sampling error, um, that's when a non-random sampling method is used to collect data. So this one you could actually get rid of, right? Because you say, well, wait, if we just used a simple random sample or a stratified random sample or a cluster sample, right? Those all have randomization components in them. So you'd think, well, if you use one of those, then you don't have to worry about this. That's true, right? So this would be a problem if it happened, right? Because you might get really distorted results, but you can also get rid of it. So that's nice. Um, and I think that would be everything for section 1.3. Um, I believe 2.1 is really long. I'm going to make that one tomorrow. So I think we're going to find out, but I know I wrote that one to be long. I think the notes are like seven or eight pages. Um, so this one, a lot of terminology, um, and it's relatively short though, but I think the next one actually does end up being kind of long.